Are we live? Is it working? Oh my gosh, I don't know if anyone can actually hear me. So I guess I'm gonna have to look in the chat. Let me know if you can hear me because I've never used OBS before in this manner. So I might not actually be communicating sound. Let me see. Oh, oh, 15 people? Here, I'll type it in the chat. Can, can you all hear me? Those who might be here. Wow, I really got this set up late, sorry. <laughs> oh, you can hear me, good. All right, so I'm gonna try to pull over people from Discord too because we changed this to YouTube last second because I wanted to record it and also just get it out there to more folks. So um, yay, it's working. All right, let me know if anything gets crazy during this stream, like if I suddenly sound super loud or if the video cuts out or something, I'll try to keep an eye on the chat so that uh, we can address any problems as they come up. And <laughs> that'll be a true test of my uh, technology skills here, fixing something live. Um, okay, let me just check in with the Discord server real quick. Let me know where you guys are tuning in from too. I don't know if everyone is from all over the place. It is Saturday, so hopefully, you know, we, we have some flexibility with who can jump in given it's a weekend. All right, let me see. All right, time for we're live. Mm -mm -mm. Um, what should we tell them, you all? I don't know what the link is, but just go to my channel. No, what the link? Let me get the link for everybody. Toronto, Eastern Canada, Ireland. Wow, we have so many people from all over the place. This is exciting. What is my channel, you guys? Is it youtube.com slash the arcane library? I'm, I'm the best at, oh yeah, it is. I'm so good at managing things. There we go. All right, we'll give folks like a couple more minutes to trickle in. Okay, wow, here we are. Hey, Zion is here. Hey, Zion, what's up, dude? All right, Toronto, Ireland, Portland. Hi, hi to Portland, all you in Portland. Okay. This will be exciting because I'm going to try to use OBS to jump between things. <laughs> um, and I think what you guys are seeing right now is my face plus notes, which is good um, because I'm going to try to write down our notes here. So the, the thing about this is I'm, I'm writing a one shot from scratch. Um, it's going to be for 5e. I might end up publishing it. Um, it all depends you know, if it's a good idea or not, but I'm going to try to get us a good idea using my actual process for this. Um, starting from nothing. I did not, literally nothing to pre-plan this so it could be as authentic as possible. And I'm hoping you guys see not only is this still a struggle for people like me who do this professionally, but it's, it's kind of like a different animal each time you do it, slightly different each time. Um, and so this, I'm hoping, will kind of dispel some of the mystery around adventure writing. And if you are interested yourself in writing or publishing adventures, um, I hope that this will give you sort of like a look into how people who take themselves so seriously doing this like myself actually accomplish the process. So, um, and also just as a final thing, this is gonna be a series because of course we can't write an entire one shot in one sitting. So I'm hoping I can walk us through this process and kind of cover the important pieces of it in chunks as we go and you guys can see how things develop. Um, oh, hey, Kelsey. Kelsey with two eyes. You're here now. Good. Hello. And that way, um, as we break this down sort of into bits and pieces, um, it'll hopefully appear a little more organized and manageable if you're following along in this process. So, all right, we have folks here. I don't know if my, if my chat stream is live, but I hope it is. So let's just... Let's just give this a shot here. So I'm gonna switch over to my notes. You guys can see my screen keeps changing every time I do that. 
Um, writing a fifth edition one shot from scratch. This is always the scariest moment because it's a blank page, right? Um, and here's a funny trick. Some of you guys know that I used to have a problem with um, like a notebook. I, would, I was afraid to destroy my notebooks and I would be staring at this blank page in my beautiful like hardcover notebook. Like I can't ruin it with my ideas. It's so beautiful. I don't want to write down bad ideas. So um, that is something we have to get over first and foremost. So if you're writing your notes in a notebook, which is how I usually start, you should just start by literally defiling the page. Like I'm not kidding. Like take your pen, take a pen. Don't do this in pencil. Take a pen and draw a bunch of garbage like all over one of the pages. Doodles, silly things, like fun ideas, terrible handwriting. And this is like kind of a psychological trick for getting you past like that blank page writer's block where you don't want to ruin the beauty of your notebook. And I learned this tip from my friend Alex Alvarez who's a wonderful designer and writer and it, it really works. So that's what I would do. Now, ooh, <laughs> that Spanish kid is here. <laughs> Hello, Julio. All right, so we're gonna do that. We're gonna do that here. Like, um, do not place your writing and or notebook on a pedestal. There we go. Thanks, autocorrect. The more important you make this feel, the harder it's gonna be. So just be like, ah, we're just having fun. Really, you should be having fun when you're writing an adventure. I still do every time I sit down to write. And if something's not fun, then it's just, people can sense that in the final product. So when you sit down to do this, just be like, hey, we're just gonna have fun. I'm gonna use cool ideas I come up with. No idea is terrible. We can always edit things. We can always improve things. So we're gonna just go with what comes to us and what we think is cool. And if you think an idea is cool, someone else will too. So go with what you're feeling, you know? All right, so starting off, I love using this book. This is a non-paid advertisement. The Tome of Adventure Design. I don't know if y'all can see this. It's by Matt Finch. And this book is, it's, it's the best book I've ever read about creative design, especially for fantasy RPGs. And you can use it for any system. It's system agnostic. I think he, I think Matt wrote this for Swords and Wizardry, which is an OSR um, kind of recreation. And I use this for 5e D&D &D all the time because it doesn't matter. So um, I usually start off in this book trying to come up with ideas. And what's great about this book is it does a lot of word associations. Like it'll give you some weird um, like adjectives and cool fantasy sounding words to smash together. And those are really the component pieces of creativity. It's not like a fully formed idea that comes to you immediately. It's something that rises out of some feelings and inspirations and some small little Lego pieces. So I'm going to flip open to a page in here about, um, dungeon design. It probably will like open flat to it because I've been on this page so many times. Oh, uh, here. Nope. No, it won't. Not when I'm on a live stream, it sure won't. All right, so book three in this, this is like a compiled book, page 126, let's go there. 126, book three, dungeon design. So we're gonna start off, I believe the adventure we're going to write, um, I'm just feeling this in my bones here, I think it's gonna be a site-based adventure, which means it's there's some location to explore and that's what people really, that's kind of the typical expectation with a one shot. It doesn't have to be that, like you could do something really cool. Like I recently heard about someone write an adventure that took place while traveling down a river. So the whole adventure was like the events that took place during, during the um, traveling portion down a river. And that means that it's not really a site based adventure. It's like an events based adventure. And I actually just wrote one of those too. I'm releasing it uh, next week. It's a purely events-based adventure. However, for the sake of a generic one-shot and the kind of thing DMs are normally expecting, you usually want at least some small location for characters to go explore or fight enemies or accomplish some tasks. So that's what we're gonna do with this one. So let's see. Adventure. I'm gonna flip to the, my like my favorite page in here, which is um, kind of word associations to help come up with some ideas. And what we're gonna do 
is develop a bunch of them. We're gonna generate a bunch of different words and that's gonna help us start to come up with maybe like a feeling um, or I guess a concept because when I tell you I did not think about this ahead of time, I am serious. I tried not to not to preload this so that it was so that it would be authentic. Now, will I be able to find the page we need? That's the next question here. All right, you guys. Word associations. I'm gonna have to look at the index. Uh -huh -huh. Where are you? I know it's in the middle of the book somewhere. I really should be using bookmarks at this point in my life here. Um, the create one, one twenty-seven locations. Oh yeah, I think that was it. Page eight. It actually might be this page. Page eight. If you're following along, you two can. Here we go. Oh, this is cool. Okay, so we're gonna come up with a name. <laughs> Let's see. I love this. Okay, so actually this is on page 10. If you're following along, this is on page 10. We're going to use these amazing roll tables to develop a cool name for our one shot and that might give us some inspiration. So if anyone, I wish, I wish this was truly live, the chat, so I could get you guys to roll for me. But I'm gonna roll to, I'm gonna roll a percentile die here and tell you what we get. 48, 48. Hydroponic? Mm, I don't like that, so we're already gonna reroll. All right, 75. 75, Sapphire. All right, let me write these down for us. This is seriously how I generate ideas for adventure starting off. So we have Sapphire as our first word, and this asks for us to roll four words. So we have the Sapphire, do, 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 carnival of the, my next result's a 50, of the, oh, of the jade. There's a lot of cool colors in here. And my final results are 33 of the Jade Giants. Oops, Giants. All right, that's just one, one result rolling across the line. And you can get literally thousands of permutations from this table. So Sapphire Carnival of the Jade Giants. Question, does this inspire any visual ideas in your mind already? Because for me, it does. Um, I'm already thinking, especially because I just read Wild Beyond the Witchlight, I'm already thinking about some kind of interesting carnival um, with a lot of different colors and glowing sort of jeweled tones or magic involved with it. And then of the Jade Giants, that's extra cool because what if we did like a carnival for giant beings? Because surely they have their own carnivals too, or they should. And what would that look like? And what is a Jade Giant? That's actually really neat. So for me, that inspires a ton of visual ideas, and that's where you wanna go when you first start generating these potential adventure ideas. You want it to give you some kind of strong visual image, even if it's just fleeting. You know, even if you just imagine like one scene or one monster, um, that means that you're headed in the right direction. So I'm gonna roll three more of these up because when I'm generating adventure ideas and anytime I'm using a roll table of this sort, I'll usually generate four to five times more results than I think I need. And then I'll go with my favorites. So that way you don't feel super stuck on what you just rolled. So let's just do, let's do uh, one or two more. So, whoops, a seven, I got a seven. So that, ooh, this sounds cool too. So we've got bone as number seven, 86, bone pavilion of the, let's see, oh, an 83. Oh, of the shadow, of the shadow, hounds, whoa. Honestly, that's super cool too. I mean, like sometimes these results feel haunted because to me, these concepts go together so well, like hounds and, and bones, and then shadow hounds is a really cool idea in and of itself. Like, I don't know about you all, but I was imagining like, smoky hellhounds maybe, like maybe a different flavor of hellhound, or maybe some creatures like the Hound of the Baskervilles, like these sort of mysterious uh, undead or wolf-like creatures, definitely maybe some horror vibes. And then a pavilion is interesting, you know? We could always re-roll that result. Like, this is what I might even do. I'm gonna re-roll that just to see what else we get. So 35, so dwelling I also got. I'm gonna put that as a note here. Dwelling 
Um, we'll try one more. 18. Do, 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 do. City. Oh, wow. City. Whoop. And we'll do one more just for good measure. And that would be oh, Foundry. So you can keep going like this. And I think I personally like the Bone Dwelling or Pavilion of the Shadow Hounds because that makes me think of a place where they might, these, these hounds might live. So, all right, we're coming up with ideas here. Now, I won't put you guys through making me, uh, watching me do this again. I just wanna check the comments too. Is the concept storyboard thought diagram useful, Julio asked. Um, it will be at a certain point. Yeah, once we get through this very first step, which is the idea generation process, um, which should be very focused on imagery. Like you, you wanna be able to see things in your mind or at least a scene in your mind before you sit down to write because, and I myself have made this mistake, you have to imagine something before you design it. You have to imagine first, design later, in the immortal words of someone who I've never named specifically because I never got their permission to, but uh, because it was, that advice was um, from a conversation that that person and I had about something I was writing that really helped me. Um, it's a, it's a well-known adventure reviewer who was gracious enough to give me some time and I was struggling with, with writing something that I'm working on for Shadow Dark RPG. And I was getting really stuck in the mechanical side of the writing and the layout side. And I was forgetting to just vividly imagine the place I was trying to describe. And it, it, was, it was coming through as flat in the writing because you could tell by reading it that I actually didn't have a very clear visualization of the space I was talking about, of the creatures I was talking about. It was a little too flimsy. And of course, this reviewer picked up on it right away and was like, you need to imagine first, design second. And so when we're talking here about this process, I always want to start myself and you guys off with giving you a strong visual image that you can then build on because you can't go anywhere without a strong visual image in your mind. So let's see what some of your comments are in the meantime as well. <laughs> Shackled to the tyranny of a blank notebook. I know, it's so painful. You have to just defile the notebook. Do not bend to the tyranny of the notebook. Um, yes, a good name is important. Um, Carbuncle Krakens and the Emerald Echidnas. Yeah, that's, <laughs> I like that one too. So um, final bit of advice about idea generation. You can make these lists for yourself. And I've done that before too, where you'll write like a D20 roll list of just like cool adjectives or cool adventure site locations that you can think of. And actually, if you guys um, if you guys are in my Discord or on my newsletter, I actually made a resource that has some of this in it that I'm gonna be sharing out in the next week or two. It has like a bunch of roll tables that you can use for generating adventure site names and just ideas for what an adventure might be. Um, and also some help with, um, you know, dungeon layout itself, helping you generate some random ideas for dungeons and stuff. So I'm going to be sharing that out with everybody who's on my newsletter and in my Discord. And I would love for you to get a copy of that if it would help you. So, hello. <laughs> hello, I have arrived, says DP. <laughs> Hi. All right. So let's, let's choose one of these ideas. Let's imagine I had come up with 10 and I, you know, really... Um, really zeroed in on the one that gave me the strongest ideas and images to start with. Um, and in this case, I don't know how you all feel about these results, but I am feeling the um, like bone dwelling of the shadow hounds just because I know that's gonna be a, um, a site that I can really develop out. I love the Sapphire Carnival of the Jade Giants. Um, that one does actually sound really cool, but um, I think a carnival site is a little more, it would be a little more involved to turn that into like an actual adventure location because uh, we're gonna come to the next important piece here of adventure design, which is there must be an urgent problem facing the characters. When you're selecting your initial idea to move forward with, a lot of people will kind of go back and forth about, well, is this idea good enough to sit down and write? Like, am I, gonna, am I gonna hit a wall halfway through it and regret investing my time in this idea? Um, the answer to that is you don't need to overthink that concern. Um, because as long as you, A, start off with some, some decent imagery, something you can see or feel kind of clearly, 
And as long as you move forward into the adventure design with an urgent problem facing the characters, you're, you're not gonna really hit a wall. You're not gonna regret investing time. You're gonna be able to take that idea to completion. So I see people get hung, on, hung up on this all the time where they'll hem and haw for days about, oh, is this idea better or is that idea better? Um, is this one gonna result in stronger encounters or that one? And the honest truth is you don't need to get hung up on that. Just pick one that you like that you know you can present an issue with. So step two when I am sitting down to write an adventure is I choose my thing and now I come up with the problem. Like what is this adventure actually going to be about? And the only qualifier is that it has to be something urgently facing the characters. So we can come up with a few ideas for this and let's try, let's try to do that. Let's see if I can come up with a few ideas. Who knows? Maybe I didn't have enough coffee today. So urgent problem. In order to move forward with this, with this adventure, we need to come up with an urgent problem. So a lot of the time there's some, there's either some thing bad that needs to be stopped. There's kind of three, there's kind of three ways you could take this. The characters like need to go to the location to complete a mission, which might involve an item or a person, or they need to stop something bad from occurring that's going to directly affect them. A lot of times in fifth edition adventures, you, you don't have the purpose of the adventure be exploration of the site. You can, but that's actually, when we're talking about like writing a one shot for someone else to use, you usually have to, you want to give a motivation along with the adventure for the characters to latch onto. Now in like in a home game or in an ideal world, we'd be able to write purely exploration driven adventures because that's the heart and soul of D&D. That's actually where it started, where um, hooks and motivations were just baked into the game. It was go get treasure so you can level up. But now in the, in the decades since D&D has sort of built new additions and built upon like the expectations for the game, most of the time for fifth edition, players are expecting some kind of driving reason to go do something that isn't simply go kill monsters to get XP and level up. There's usually some kind of story tie in that we need. So, and it's all down, this is down to the style of the, um, of the current edition. So if I was gonna write an OSR adventure, I probably wouldn't so strongly worry about like what's the urgent problem or the hook that's gonna pull the characters here because that's actually not, a, that's not an expected thing to supply necessarily in like a first edition adventure, but in fifth edition, it, it really often is. So let's come up with some problems. We can have a problem relating to um, an NPC or a problem relating to an item, like a MacGuffin it's called, or a problem relating to um, overall danger. And let me give you some examples of what I mean. So an NPC problem could be important. NPC has been captured or is trapped here. It's a pretty common one. That's a good one for a one shot because a, a GM can actually just grab an important NPC from their world and insert that as a powerful hook for their own group. Um, and I've used that one a few times before in my writing. Another one is a MacGuffin. So there's an item that needs to be destroyed, found, delivered, um, you know, repaired, etc. So it's, it's a quest involving some kind of item. And then overall danger, I guess this is kind of broad, but we could say something like um, there's a growing threat. Um, there, that's, that's kind of vague, actually, a growing threat. That's pretty broad. So that's probably what an overall danger actually is. There is some kind of growing threat. There is some kind of imminent disaster. Um, let me know if you guys think of any other examples of that. And so that's kind of, that's kind of, uh, like, generally speaking, those are three places you can start. Now, in the Tome of Adventure design, there are lots of different motivations you could try to generate using the roll tables, which are really helpful, but I won't make you guys watch me roll and roll and roll on those tables. I like the idea. Let's go with, um, let's go with a rescue mission, maybe? Here's an example of one. So we'll do like a rescue mission for the Shadowhounds 
the, the bone dwelling of the shadow hounds. So we could say that an NPC wandered to the bone pavilion, a forbidden area or taboo area, and has gone missing, as NPCs do. <laughs> so now our job, the character's job, so urgent problem, rescue NPC, or find. If we want to go extra grim here, we could say that um, interested parties simply want the characters to find out the fate of this NPC. If we want to go a little more hopeful, we would say rescue the NPC. And I think how you pitch that to the characters from the start will determine how much horror you want to insert into this. So um, now let's think of another example for a MacGuffin. So a MacGuffin example would be um, the, ooh, so we could say like marauding, oh, can I spell? Marauding shadow hounds have have stolen something important, maybe something magical. We'll think of that later. Something important from a, ooh, a passing, ooh, how about a wizard? If, okay, whenever there's a wizard involved and then something gets stolen from the wizard, you know that's not good because it's probably some magical apocalypse artifact. So we'll say from a wizard, they ambushed. So this leads to two questions here. Where did these hounds come from? Why are they marauding? And what will happen if we don't recover the item? The answer to that obviously is bad things. <laughs> All right, and then let's do an example of an imminent disaster as a, maybe a third adventure problem, an urgent problem here. So imminent disaster, to me, the first thing that comes to mind is the shadow hounds are growing in number and audacity. So we could say that perhaps these hounds have been appearing more and more in a certain area and they've been increasing in number and um, violence. And so we have to figure out why that's happening here, the urgent problem, find out why it's happening and how to stop it before the hounds take over a vulnerable area. Um, this in particular is very like Hound of the Baskervilles to me because it makes me think the shadow hounds are a growing threat in a location, like maybe a village or somewhere that doesn't have really strong defenses set up. And these hounds are therefore the source of like a lot of superstition and fear and I, I think I like that idea. I think of these three ideas, imminent disaster one is my favorite because it creates a lot of urgency and it also allows us to really incorporate several NPCs right away, which is good. And it lets us inject a lot of mystery into the adventure because I think of these three, the imminent disaster example we came up with has the most like, why is this happening feel to it. Um, and for me, I love horror, so that's always great. Mystery is the core of horror. Not understanding why something is happening and trying to find out why and make sense of it is the best way to generate feelings of horror and fear in an adventure. So I am gonna go with that one, I think. That's the one that I feel most inspired by right now. So let me bold our choices here. So for now, we're gonna go with Bone Pavilion. I kind of like Pavilion. I don't know, what do you guys think? Let me see what the chat says. Do you guys like pavilion or dwelling? Um, the shadow heart is from the hounds from the boneyard. <laughs> Let the dogs out. Um, typing outside of what we can see. If you care, you're typing outside of what we can see. Only the top 25% is visible. <gasps> hey, I'm so glad you told me. Um, here, let me see if I can scroll this around. Um, there we go. Okay, wait. Oh, oh. Darn you, OBS. See, you can tell this is my first time using OBS. Um, I'm gonna zoom it out enough so that you can see it over my head here. Can you? What if I do this? I'm trying to see what you can see in the preview. Uh, <laughs> wait, what if I move my face up here? Did that move my face? Okay. Let's see if you can see this now. Uh-huh. Learning, 
how to use OBS live and on the fly. Um, typing off screen, pavilion dwelling, pavilion. We've got lots of different votes here. You know what? I'll try to share this, um, these notes out. They're probably not going to be that pretty, but I'll try to share the whole document out with you all afterwards so that you can refer to it, if you, especially if you kind of can't see what I'm typing here because I am stinky at OBS. So, all right. Dwelling, pavilion, dwelling. So to me, okay, let's, let's pick between these. Um, dwelling to me definitely sounds a little bit more like an organized, like a nest or a place where our uh, potential shadow hounds are really like making their home actively. Whereas pavilion, that word to me carries a little bit more of like a, maybe a religious or like a totemic aspect, like a, a structure built for some purpose that isn't necessarily a home, but it has some kind of significance or meaning. And can I change the margin to make a fatter margin on the left? Maybe I can, I'll work on that while we talk. I personally, um, feel a little bit more pulled towards the idea of a pavilion because it has sort of an esoteric vibe. And when we're talking about shadow hounds and we're talking about mystery, um, moving in that direction seems a little bit stronger to me than moving towards dwelling because dwelling make, kind of makes the hounds, it kind of um, accentuates a little bit of mundanity. Um, a home or a, a den or a nest is something that's like familiar to characters. And removing familiarity adds to this, the mystery. So I, I might actually go with pavilion here. And I think what, I, what idea is forming in my head, um, a little bit of this thanks to some writing by Harley Stroh. What was the name of the adventure? He wrote an adventure like Doom of the Savage Kings where there was like a haunted dog in it. I really love that adventure. Um, so I think I'm going to be inspired by him, which by the way, inspiration is always kind of recycling things that you like in some way or another. So I think we're going to go with pavilion and I'm going to make that like one of you guys might have said in the comments a little bit, something like a place of druids or a place of magic. And this is giving me some ideas for maybe how to solve the problem, which is the next thing you have to know when you're writing an adventure. You have to, so let's recap where we are. We generated an idea that we got some cool visuals for. I'm thinking like, to, to share some of those, like a swampy situation, like a misty sort of forest, like rural area, um, like a mysterious structure made of like ancient bones with moss on them. Like I'm almost getting maybe like a, like a Florida, like Everglades type vibe from this. Um, that's just where my mind went. You, maybe you thought of some other kind of forest or, um, it could even be like a desert setting. I mean, that would be cool too, but I'm going like forest Everglades and like mangroves and stuff like that. That's where I'm going with this. So that's some strong visual images I got from rolling on these tables, just right off the bat, out of nowhere. They just appeared in my mind. And then we have now our, so we have kind of a title and a concept to go with. And then we had to decide what is the urgent problem the characters have to solve. And after generating a few different types of ideas, we came up with the strongest contender being an imminent disaster of some kind. The problem being the characters have to find out why these shadow hounds are growing in number, why they're appearing, and how to stop them because they have been harming people, terrorizing people, causing problems. All right, so now I'm gonna start adding to our notes. Let's see if we can actually see this. What if I actually add some space at the bottom of this document? Does that do anything? Um, hmm. Can I zoom? Zoom it out? When I do that, it suddenly... Oh, what if I resize the window? Oh, that worked a little bit, I think. Okay. Um, all right. So let me put some notes here. So step... This is actually step one generate some ideas. So step two, to um, identify the urgent problem the characters can solve. Maybe I'll add on to that. You need the urgent problem to be something that the characters will solve and can solve. 
you should not make a problem that like a, a villager could solve or like uh you know an a, a, an unheroic person and i kind of bag on this example a lot but i think one of my least favorite concepts for an adventure is you have to deliver the wolf pelts to the next city or insert item here you have to deliver the beer to the next city why to make them happy okay um, it doesn't take a hero to do that, and I don't know, the characters probably, even if it's dangerous, like, oh, the goblins have been attacking merchants, but, like, that's just life in that era, like, life traveling on the road back in supposed fantasy times was kind of dangerous, and the deliver the wolf pelts concept isn't an urgent problem, like, why are the characters so concerned about that, or, like, why is delivering the beer to make the town happy, like, that's a nice thing to do, but like, in what way does that impact the characters heroically, you know? So, yeah, in a way, that's a problem that could use, that, that, I mean, the characters, I can see them maybe being motivated to do that, but I wouldn't call that strongly motivating. In this example here, we're on the right track because the urgent problem involves evil, mysterious hounds that are like killing people and have appeared after some eldritch thing out of the mangroves. That's a compelling problem. Like, you need a brave hero to take care of that issue. So, yeah, people are asking fetch quests and escort quests. I have never thought that those made fun or compelling adventures. I might be wrong. I don't know. I'll make some arguments against and maybe you can convince me. We'll see. But um, let's make sure that the concept we proceed with is in need of a hero to solve. So, wolves are naked and cold without those pelts. <laughs> I know, that's a serious issue here. All right, so now I'm gonna take us back. Sorry, I circled way out of the way here because this is unscripted, but I'm gonna take us back to step three in what we need. Step three is knowing how to solve the problem that we are introducing. Don't start writing until you know how to fix the issue at hand because you need to know. Like, who are the villains? Like, what direction are we writing toward? Because once we come up with these, these ideas, we're going to start writing an outline and we need to be able to take ourselves from the inception of the adventure to the conclusion. You don't want to just write off in a direction without knowing where you're going. That's probably the number one way to um, burn out on your adventure writing or feel frustrated or stuck. So before you even sit down to outline anything, at least what I do is I, I have to know. Like I don't have to know all the steps in between, but I have to know where we're starting and where we're trying to end up. And this is where we determine the pass-fail state of the adventure. Um, how do we know that the characters succeeded at the adventure? And how do we know that they failed? And are we making sure to allow for both options? So this is a great point to... to this is, this is going to incorporate some self-checks because you, you don't want to ever write an adventure that has a foregone conclusion. You know, it can't be like rescue the king and then if the king almost dies, the some miraculous god swoops in and saves the king so that, you know, everything's okay in the end. Like, no, if you're going to put the king in peril, you have to be willing to let the king die as a result of the adventure, which would be the fail state of the adventure. Um, I love doing this kind of thing. Like, I, I love writing adventures that, that GMs can use that will shake up the some of the important things that are going on in their game world like oh an example i wrote um an adventure for 15th level characters called gate of the lens wizards and that uh spoiler alert if you're playing it stop listening um that has an item in it that can actually rewrite history and once characters are at 15th level or so that that's about the power level you ought to be gambling with anyway around that time in their adventuring career but um, don't be afraid if you're writing something you might publish to have strong consequences work their way into the adventure. They, it needs consequences of some kind. So we're going to come up with the pass fail state now. Let me see. You know, what's weird. I feel like the chat is different depending on where I look. This is fascinating. Um, okay. So, okay. Document back to the document. So step three, unbolded. Three, figure out pass fail state of adventure. What is the conclusion? All right, you guys, let's come up with something here. So we don't know a ton about the villains or the monsters yet, but I think knowing the problem we set out 
the conclusion of the adventure will have something to do with um, figuring out how to stop or appease or end the um, attacks of the shadow hounds. So that would be what we would call the past state. Um, let's let's talk about you know what? Let me move these onto the next page here. Let's see if you guys can see the next page. Um, ooh, I love how it always shrinks down when I okay. Um, all right. So now what we're doing? Oh, and here's a good point here in the in the chat. I just saw this. So um, we do not want to plan how the characters are going to solve this problem. That's not our job. Our job is to create problems as the writer and the dungeon master. Now, I mean, we're not going to make a problem that's preposterously hard to solve. Like, we're not going to throw first level characters into a, a mountain is tipping over on a nearby village. You have to figure out how to stop it in three hours kind of situation. Like, we're not going to do that. Like, but when we present a problem, you as the DM will probably begin to think of ways that the characters could solve this and good, but it's not necessary to present those as options. You want the characters to figure it out for themselves and believe me, they will. Like anytime I run a game or write a game and run it for people, players are, are so creative. They come up with ways to solve problems that I never would have guessed, even when I meticulously plan something. And I've just come to rely on that as something that you just assume, like assume that the characters will find a way to solve the problems you put in front of them. And the more tricky it is for them or the more, the more fun it can be. I won't say you don't want to make it impossible, but again, the more creativity that is required to solve a problem, the better. So. Um, just throw them into the body of a Tarrasque. Yeah, you could do that. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna talk about the fail state here. Fail state. Why is that bold? Let's see if you guys can uh, see this, hopefully. The fail state in a lot of adventures is, um, often involves the characters dying in some way. So we'll say, um, we'll just say characters can't figure out why hounds are attacking and they are unable to stop them. Ways this can happen, they die, they give up, they ally themselves with the hounds. Um, I guess allying themselves with the hounds wouldn't necessarily be a fail state. For the, for the binary purposes of determining past fail state for this adventure, we'll call that a fail state because um, initially the goal was to stop the hounds. So if they fail to do that, it probably means that they, if they ally with the hounds, it's probably because they've turned evil in some way because these hounds, in my opinion, are not like a force for good in the world. So we'll continue, we'll call that a fail state, even though that's actually kind of a fun and cool outcome, if you ask me. Um, I don't know, can you all think of any other ways in which they might pass fail the adventure? Um, hmm, 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 hmm. Oh, this is the part that's exciting where I flounder around. Um, hmm, hmm, hmm. I think a couple works. I wonder why the background keeps, oh yeah. Um, we'll call that, well, we can always add to this, so we'll call that good for now. Um, alternate, ooh, an alternate victory condition. Um, yeah, like another another example of maybe the the fail state here is like they they attack the wrong source of the problem and therefore they fail to um they they just or like yeah the characters fail to correctly address the problem like they take some insane red herring and they're like oh you know this is definitely happening because um the witch the next town over is involved in some way, so we're gonna go spend the next however long um, pursuing the witch when she doesn't have anything to do with it. As the adventure writer, you probably don't have room to account for all the potential ways the characters will go off track. Um, in fact, in fact, it, you really don't want to do that. There, there are some, um, there's some like tests you can put your uh, encounters through to make sure that you really ought to be including it at all in the adventure. So we'll get to that at some point. But I think we have a good, a good idea of some pretty typical past fail states for now. 
So, ooh, the idea of feeling forward. Yes, a good DM will figure out how to turn that situation, like the characters pursuing a witch the next town over, into an adventure unto itself, and maybe weave that back into the overall problem here. So, um, one thing I've also learned after years of adventure writing is trust the DM. You, you don't need to necessarily hold a DM's hand, not even a new DM, because someone who's sitting down to DM is prepared to be creative. They have come there to do creative things. Um, and DMs are really good at coming up with ways to sort of poke and prod the story around and um, I guess allow the characters to move in the direction they want to go ultimately, which is the most important thing. So trust the DM to fill in the blanks, to participate in the adventure, which means they're allowed to come up with some things and um, they're allowed to exercise some creativity and improv skills, you want that because a DM isn't a battle robot. They don't, they're not just going to sit there reading the script. Like The fun is finding out what's going to happen. And I don't know about you, but when I'm DMing, I want to be surprised by what the characters do. And yes, I want to have enough information to be relatively prepared for likely outcomes or likely situations, but I don't want to just run the whole thing on script. Like I want to be able to come up with cool stuff on the fly too. And the more you give room for that in the adventure, the easier it becomes to run because it's not so strict and so prescribed and rigid that a DM has to follow the rules of what you've written. Like you have to find a good balance. And in my opinion, the balance leans more towards freedom and less defined things so that you can have participation from the dungeon master themselves. Okay, I've gone on very long about this. Now, I think we'll go through a bit more of this initial process here before the next step and the next stream, which is gonna be probably about outlining your adventure. So we're already at the point where we can really start kind of conceptualizing the adventure's path. Um, so let me think, what do I like to do now at this point in, in adventure writing? I have an idea, we know the beginning and the end. So let's touch briefly now on scope, like numbers and like actual, how are we going to get down to the nitty gritty of how long to make this. Um, if we're talking about a one shot with Dungeons and Dragons, that, that usually means an adventure someone or a group could accomplish in a sitting. So like, you know, most groups actually play for about three hours in this day and age, and I would say three to four hours is a sitting. Um, so we want to aim for an adventure of that length. Now, will it run sh really short for some people and really long for others? I mean, yeah, some, you just can't control for the extreme ends of things, but you want to try to aim for a number of encounters a number of likely encounters that's going to produce about like three and a half, four hours worth of material. So in my opinion, that's about like six to eight encounters because we'll assume that each, each one takes like about a half hour on average, like sure, like combat takes longer and certain like NPC negotiations or something might not. Or you might have a group like mine who takes literally two hours figuring out how to cross a pit trap and then defeats the final confrontation in like, four rounds. <laughs> so you just don't know, but on balance, I'd, I'd say that each one is about, each encounter is about a half hour. So we're going to talk about scope here as sort of our final thing. Um, we're looking for something that's three to five hours, which means 30 minutes per encounter. And math is, math is good. Um, so we'll say, we'll say like six to eight encounters. Um, and that's going to look something like this. We're going to start off with a hook and an intro. And then we're going to have, uh, we don't know, we don't know. We'll just make uh, six spaces here. Eight. Let's make eight just for the sake of. Um, and then I'm actually going to have the eighth one. I tend to do this. I'm going to have the eighth one be like an aftermath scene because Whenever the characters complete an adventure, there is going to be some denouement. There's going to be the need to sort of wrap up and have the outcomes of the adventure, you know, have the DM explain that. And that's all a part of the game time that you'll have allotted. So I would always account for an aftermath section as one of your encounters to make sure you can tie the adventure up 
and give the characters like a start and a complete end. So this gives us a fair amount to work with. We have a hook and an intro and an aftermath. And we have one, two, three, four, five, six encounters to create that will take us. So we have to take ourselves from um, learning about the hounds to ending the threat of the shadow hounds. Denouement, how do you say that? <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce words. I know how to read them. Um, <laughs> so I think we're gonna talk about this process in the next live stream because we've been on for like a little under an hour. It's a lot of information to soak in. And we're gonna look at how to fill in the question marks on this outline that I just made. Um, each encounter sort of taking us closer to the conclusion that we have determined for the adventure. Hook, question marks, profit. <laughs> yes, and like this is the core of adventure writing and I think um, if you've been following along or you want to follow along on this process, um, get to this point with yourself. So recap, we're gonna come up with an idea with some maybe random idea generation, some random role tables, and some sort of loose creative association, which is the best way to come up with ideas in my opinion. And then we're going to select our favorite items and create an urgent problem that involves the characters that they must solve. And then once we come up with that problem, we're gonna, <laughs> it's pronounced in no. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just got distracted by a funny, okay. I still don't know how to pronounce that word. Uh, I expect someone to correct me soon, please. Um, so circling back. You're coming up with the urgent problem that involves the characters. And then your next step after that is to figure out how do we know when this problem has been solved? Or how do we know when the problem has not been solved and will never be solved? It, essentially the fail state. Once you know those two things, um, what the problem is and how it will or will not be solved, then you wanna determine what is the scope of the adventure. Um, and I'm gonna write that down here. So step four, scope of adventure, Adven adventure. We have decided ahead of time how long we want this to be, three to five hours, 30 minutes per encounter, so we're gonna write around six to eight encounters. Um, you wanna do that process where you structure a bit of a, a set, a one through eight setup here, so you know um, what to start doing for your outline, which will be our next live stream. And we'll take ourselves from how the characters learn about the Shadow Hounds with a strong, like a great hook, a great hook that pulls them right in, and how that will lead them into the adventure of learning about and ending the Shadow Hounds in their scary mangrove bone pavilion. So, okay. Hey, that's it. Thanks for listening, everybody. Um, I'm gonna send out that cool stuff on my Discord channel, that cool set of roll tables for you, and um, jump, jump on my newsletter if you want a copy of it as well. I don't really know how to get it to people otherwise, like maybe I can put a link to it somewhere, but if you head to my website, thearcanelibrary.com, um, there's a Temple of the Basilisk cult link that will get you on my newsletter and it sends you a free adventure, like a, free, like a full out first level adventure. Um, and then I'll make sure I get this um, cool set of roll tables out to everyone as well. And that is, I don't understand the, what that totally says in French in the chat, but it sounds really nice, so thank you. <laughs> okay, you guys, go spend some time, go spend an hour doing this process for yourself. You should totally do it. See, it wasn't that, it, I didn't have to sweat too much blood here, and I know you can do it too. Don't put the writing on a pedestal. Go with what sounds cool to you, and follow a little bit of this step-by-step -step process here, and. You'll start writing adventure outlines before you know it. And I would love to hear what you come up with. So please let me know. And we will talk again soon. Okay, catch you next time, y'all. See you later. <laughs>